Okay, so um, I'm Diane Crocker. I'm a professor of criminology at St. Mary's University in Halifax. So yeah, so I grew interested in, I've mostly spent most of my earlier career studying domestic violence and um, uh, judicial decision making, like how judges make decisions and on policy, um, domestic violence courts and that kind of thing. Um, but I became interested in sexual violence on campus um, when we had an incident uh, at St. Mary's, uh, first year students being led in basically what amounted to a chant about rape um, by senior students in the kind of, you know, uh, first week festivities. And of course, that caused a great amount of um, stress and strain on campus and of course, calls for action and change. And that sort of got me interested. It was not um, what I was doing research in specifically, but of course, domestic violence and gender based violence or uh, sexual violence are related, so it kind of caught my attention, and it also caught my attention because of um, the work that I've done in domestic violence was around policy and how to respond and um, different ways of thinking about responses, like, for example, using restorative justice approaches. Um, so when we had our incident on campus and people started talking about, you know, well, what are we going to do about it? Um, I became really interested in the ways in which people were proposing very simple solutions. You know, if we have a really good policy that'll create, you know, culture change on campus. And I felt that was sort of, um, I mean, it was the only thing, it's the only thing people, it's the only thing we know how to do when faced with those problems is sort of make better policy or tweak the law, you know. And um, in my domestic violence research, I felt similarly, like we've spent 30 years tweaking law and uh, developing better policies and procedures for police, for example, and it seems to not be having the big effect that we wanted to have. So, so I set up a project to um, try to explore uh, different ways of responding to campus sexual violence. So, um, I was using different research methods. So, instead of asking people what do they think we should do about campus sexual violence, um, and and knowing most of what I would get for the answers. So, you know, if you ask students what to do about campus sexual violence, they will tell you they want better policies and what to buy. You actually get at the culture problem. So I actually asked for, I used a very different research approach, which is what I'm doing in all of my work now, where I'm asking folks to tell me about narratives. So tell me a little story, tell me an anecdote, tell me something that happened. And then I collect all those up from people and I bring them back to people. We work on them together to sort of say, like, how could we have prevented this from happening? Or what's um, going right in this story? What's going wrong in this story? So um, I'm using that approach a lot in my research now to kind of shift how we learn about gender-based violence, sexual violence on campus, domestic violence, all kinds of forms of gender-based violence um, in order to kind of explore different ways of addressing the problem rather than just the tweaking of policies and criminal justice responses that we've been doing for a long time. And on campus sexual violence front, I'm really keen on finding ways to use methods of responding that aren't punitive, that aren't about, you know, um, well, that aren't punishment, that are actually about meaningful accountability, and that meaningful accountability is a way to create culture change, not just punishment um, that doesn't have any meaning for the perpetrator. So I'm really interested in that uh, kind of shift now. So the project specifically, um, the, the biggest, the Bayer Campo Sexual Violence Project that I did was um, inviting students at St. Mary's and um, Mount St. Vincent to share incidents of, of various forms of sexual violence on campus or even examples of what might be called rape culture. Um, so they shared short paragraphs, and so those short stories could have ranged from, you know, a, a, a horrific story of, um, you know, a, a fellow student experiencing a really, a, you know, a horrible sexual assault, um, or it could be um, overhearing someone tell a sexist joke while in the library. So they ranged considerably, right? Um, mm -hmm. When I asked them to tell me a story about a time when you saw an example of rape culture, right? So they would tell me these stories. And then what we did is got them to answer questions about the story. So, you know, what made this story possible? What would make it um, not happen? Um, and interestingly, one of the things that we learned that was really interesting was that most of the students didn't 
say that rules or policies or regulations would change the stories. They really saw um, changes in um, campus culture were the things is what was needed to change the story, right? That you couldn't make a policy that would stop that sexist joke in the library from happening, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing they learned that was interesting was around the idea of race culture because it's a kind of a complicated concept. Um, on the one hand, it seems sort of easy to say we live in a rape culture where you know there's lots and lots and lots of sexual jokes and fewer sexual assaults, but they're kind of in a pyramid from least to most serious. Um, and that that's, that's a rape culture, and that basically allows rape to happen. So there's lots of critiques about that concept and lots of academic debate. But what I found is when I asked students to tell me a story that showed me that rape culture was alive and well on campus, um, the stories they told were never about individual, almost never, actually I can't say never, never, almost never about um, a one-on-one, -on -one, like an interpersonal experience, like they, they weren't stories of sexual assault or sexual violence. Mm -hmm. They were actually stories um, of really of incidents that were in the news. So, for example, the the um, rape chant at St. Mary's and the Dalhousie dentist, where the where the dentist at Dalhousie posted really sexist and misogynist Facebook posts, right? Yeah. So, so that told me that um, it's a really interesting indirect way to understand what people think something is. If I said, "Please tell me what you think rape culture is." I would have gotten a bunch of definitions. You know, if someone had taken a women and gender studies course, they would have given me the last definition they learned, right? Um, but this way, you're asking them for stories that, that illustrate a concept, and the stories were, for rape culture, were not about um, individual experiences. And that, to me, was interesting in terms of how we do training on campus, because if we're training and we're using the terminology of rape culture and students are thinking these big media, relate, you know, these big events that are picked up by media and that are sort of, um, they're not directly interpersonal, they're not behind closed doors, they're, they're um, kind of, they become public events, then we're kind of missing, they're not really understanding what we're talking about, right? So if we talk mm -hmm. about sexual harassment and jokes in the library as illustrative of rape culture, they may not, it doesn't resonate, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, so we learned a lot about how students understand that idea of rape culture and we learned a lot about um, how they didn't see policy and regulations or law um, as preventing some of the incidents they talked about. And we asked students then, yeah, tell me an example of rape culture. Those are the kinds of things they come up with. And mm -hmm. they don't come up with sexual violence that happens, you know, between two and three people or two people on campus, right? So, yeah. So, yeah, okay. regardless of what the academic, like to me, is sort of important because Academics can argue about the value or the definition of that term or its empirical validity or whatever. But if students, if it doesn't, if what res, if what students hear when they hear that term is the same as the rape chant or the Dalhousie dentist, but we're actually talking about consent, then it doesn't match. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so I think it really speaks to um, how we do training differently and how we need to take on these ideas from a student's perspective and. The way to ask that is to ask them to talk about experiences, not what they think concepts mean, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, well, just, I mean, this is the social justice orientation, but this is something that, that um, you know, when I first, I mean, I first fell into the area by accident by getting a job after I graduated from university with a nonprofit that did work in the field. Um, and I think what struck me then is just how um, prevalent and pervasive and I mean, this was 30 years ago, but um, how prevalent, pervasive, and normal lies, I guess, um, violence in families is. Um, but now, I think I'm motivated a little more now that I'm sort of, you know, mid-career. I'm motivated now more by frustration that nothing is changing, that, that we seem to be doing the same thing over and over, you know, like I said before, tweaking policies trying to make the law better, trying to train everybody, um, like judges or students or whatever, whatever the context we're trying to fix, we're trying to train people not to think in sexist ways, and we still haven't moved the needle all that much, right? Um, you know, there are, if you look at statistics, I mean, they can go up and down by various small amounts, but we're not seeing any dramatic decreases in all of these forms of violence. So that, So now I'm kind of more driven by frustration over not having 
made enough progress, which is a little pessimistic, I guess, but that's sort of where I where I where I sit now. <laughs> and maybe it's more concern than frustration. I think it's something we have to um, start considering that we have made a lot of policy change since I started this work. Um, there have been lots and lots of training and education and public education and awareness campaigns and training for um, police and judges and people in the criminal justice system. Um, and we don't change the dial all that much on people's experiences, it, it, both the incidents, like how much violence we have, but also the experiences of people when they are, um, you know, brought into the criminal justice system or the social services system, right? We're still, they're still having um, horrendous experiences as, as victims um, when they go through the justice system. So um, I think what we've done is we've seen the problem as one that is solvable by better policy and that policy will drive culture change. So, for example, if you have really good policy in the police around gender-based violence, that, you know, they won't be able to just walk a violent husband around the block and tell him to stop doing it anymore, and that that'll drive culture change. I think there's been basically kind of, that's naive, that we've put our eggs in that basket and that we have to find some other drivers of culture change so that, you know, you don't have to have the perfect policy. You have actually culture change and culture that doesn't support um, the violence in the first place, and thinking really hard about um, primary prevention. So um, really focusing on primary prevention, learning from people who know about primary prevention in other fields, like health, um, and applying it to gender-based violence. Um, we've spent most money on gender-based violence and criminal justice responses, right? And that's, that's not um, great either because it isn't preventative. So I think we've done a lot of policy work. I don't think it's been, I think it's even getting easier to do policy work that's really good. Um, you know, my university is working on campus sexual violence policy and there doesn't seem to be any hesitancy of acknowledging a bunch of things about it, you know, including it's, that it's grounded in gender inequality. Those things would have been debatable even 20 years ago, I think, like putting that in a policy. So I think we've come a long way that way, but I think that, um, there's some other drivers of change that we have to start um, focusing on. And I think one of the ways we have to do that is by, like I just alluded to, shifting our attention away from criminal justice responses to gender-based violence um, when it happens and moving into more primary prevention. There's a, an interesting book called Decriminalizing Domestic Violence, which is a very provocative title because the author is not a men's rights advocate who believes that it should be you know, legal to assault mm -hmm. your partner. Um, but the idea is that we've put all of our, um, we put most of our attention into criminal justice and that we should really be equalizing the amount of attention we pay to forms of interpersonal violence in health and in education and in all the other sectors, right? And that that's not where the attention has been paid to. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I think that needs to be paid attention to going forward are men and boys. And there's actually a fair bit of work and conversations about that happening in Nova Scotia that for years we struggled to get violence against women, women and intimate partner violence on the agenda and even to be acknowledged as a problem, right? There's the famous story of the women, the woman MP whose name I've forgotten though, who brought it up to the House of Commons and it was laughed at, right? You know, mm -hmm. so we've come a long way that way. But in an effort to um, be recognized as a women's issue, we've forgotten in a way that, that men are mostly the perpetrators of violence in our society, right? Um, so naming this a women's issue is important, but naming it a men's issue is also really important. Um, mm -hmm. And that in an effort to make sure we fund and we help keep women safe, we sort of don't deal with the root causes, right? Um, yeah and the root causes lie in the way men and boys are socialized and the way masculinity is achieved and all of that stuff, I think, is the, the work that has to be done now um, in terms of changing how men become men, right? Um, and that violence not be associated with that. Because men are victimized by violence, you know, as much as women, but it's male-on-male -male violence, right? So it's also a men's problem. Um, so, yeah, so that's kind of where I'm kind of thinking that we have to start finding ways to promote culture change beyond policy and tweaking policy and training people more and expecting them to, you know, um, act differently in a – police – expect police to act differently in an institution that hasn't changed at all, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and as we can see with stuff that's happening in the police and the military around sexual harassment, 
you know, we can see that all the policies for responding in the world, and they're still deeply, sexism is deeply institutionalized in these spaces. So, so yeah, so I think we're getting there, and I think um, using, we're starting to think a little bit more around men and boys, and we're starting to think a little bit more around how you create institutional change. And I think that's actually prompted a lot by um, talk around, so for example, anti-black racism and how it's embedded in institutions, right? I think that's mm -hmm. actually helping um, raise that as the way in which these problems manifest, that they're not going to be the same, the same as employment equity. You know, we've been trying to diversify workplaces for 30 years, and workplaces are still really white, right? So many workplaces. Yeah. So, so I think um, I think that's where we're at. And so while I while I kind of I'm motivated a little bit by the sort of lack of change. I'm kind of also maybe hopeful that the, that we're at a moment of kind of awareness around social justice issues that'll change how we try to fix the problem, and we won't just be tweaking policies and adding new crimes and making harsher punishments and sentences, right, absent mm -hmm. any sense of why why the violence is happening in the first place. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it 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 just creates harm and hurt and pain and suffering and um, cycles of violence uh, and dysfunction and poor health. Um, and I mean, it just robs people of the ability to, in many cases, it robs people of their ability to live happily and healthily, right? Um, both perpetrators of the violence and those who are being harmed by it directly, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I've talked to men in prison who have perpetuated family violence, and I don't have any sympathy for the violence they perpetrated, but, you know, they're suffering. They are really suffering. You know, like the system is not helping them either. Um, when they leave prison, they're not going to be ready to live healthy, have healthy relationships either, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I don't want that. that. That shouldn't be considered as kind of a men suffer too, but it's sort of that what we are – what happens to a man who's found guilty in a, a family violence is also harmful to him and doesn't make him come out any better, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, and it's also expensive. I mean, the amount of health care, uh, you know, emergency room visits, policing calls, mental health stress, child protection involvement. I mean, it's been a very, very expensive problem when you look at how many uh, people in our society are experiencing it. So it's, costly both economically and personally I think mm -hmm. it's also another effect too I think in terms of the gender part of it is it does help maintain a little bit it does reinforce or maintain some of the gender inequalities right um, it is still a way that uh, male power can be kind of held you know in a family right so mm -hmm. that's important too I think yeah, I don't know. I mean, people, it's hard, it's, it's really hard to answer that question because, you know, you can say people should call the police if they have any thought, fear, or, you know, think that something is happening to a neighbor or a friend, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's sometimes what you'll hear is people shouldn't mind their own business when it comes to family violence. But given, you know, outcomes with the police and the criminal justice system for both victims and perpetrators, I don't know if that's the right thing to do anymore, you know, um, mm -hmm. right? Like that's kind of an obvious answer is like make sure you don't ignore it. I mean, I guess it would be to believe the people who say it's happening to them, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the kind of me too part or the time's up part, <laughs> the hashtag um, is, you know, believe people when they say it's happening. Um, and I and I think politically support, support, um political move for big change, you know, for broad social change, for things like universal child care and ways for women to achieve equality, more equality, right? Mm -hmm. That aren't just written down laws like, you know, you're not supposed to discriminate against women when you hire, but we don't have universal child care. So, yeah. so you know, to support deep structural changes that can ultimately help um, free women from these, these circumstances. I think it has to be about root causes, to be honest. Um, there's public opinion polling in Nova Scotia. Like, Nova Scotians know about the problem. They define it. Um, there's some misconceptions around the 
inequality, like that men suffer as much, uh, are victimized as often as, as women. Um, but otherwise, like, I think people know this exists. I mean, people know it exists because they're experiencing it. and They have friends and family who experience it, right? Mm. So um, I think it has to be the conversation that public education now needs to focus on some of the root causes of it. Um, yeah. So I think that's where, where we need to go next. And also education um, directly to men and boys about about how how um, their own sense of you know manliness can lead them down a road of, of violence. But I think mostly it's about root, educating people about root causes, structural root causes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think restorative justice alternatives to criminal justice when we do have these incidents happen. Um, so that would be one thing that I want, you know, that door needs to be open a little wider to deeper, more meaningful responses to individual incidents, you know, mm-hmm. uh, but also that institutionally to also be able to uh, open conversations about the ways in which institutions lend themselves to allowing these things to happen. So, you know. Uh, the police and the military are great examples, right, of how those institutions are built in ways that uh, keep the stuff hidden or make it hard to report. Um, and you can make a policy making it easy to report, but if your institution is structured in a way that, that it's hard to report, <laughs> no one's mm-hmm. going to report. Um, so I think that, like, deep structural change in some of our big institutions like military, police, courts, universities, right, universities, um are structured in ways that disadvantage women and also, of course, people who are, aren't white, right? So, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, I think the calls to action are around structural and systemic change, um, not, not tweaking of, of rules and policies and procedures. 